thank you for joining me for this Wednesday evening service of First Baptist Church in Looseville, Mississippi. Tonight, I would like to take you on a journey through the greater part of the 36th chapter of the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel may be a mystery to you, but the 36th chapter is one with which you need to become familiar. It's really my favorite chapter in the book of Ezekiel. It talks about the work that God wants to do in the lives of his people. Now, obviously, it referred to the work that God wanted to do in the life of his people in the time of Ezekiel. But as I read it, I also see some central things that are always true about what God wants to do in my life and yours. So I'd like you to look at those things with me right now. God's people, this is the context, God's people had strayed away from God. As a result, God disciplined them severely. He allowed them to be invaded by foreign armies. They lost everything. They were led away into captivity. God stripped them of everything so that they would come to realize their need of him. Isn't that how it works in your life sometimes and in mine? Although they were banished from their land, they weren't banished from God. In fact, God had a work he wanted to do in them and through them. But first, they had to know what happened and why. So I pick up reading in Ezekiel chapter 36, beginning to read in verse 16. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel was living in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways and deeds. Their way before me was like the clean uncleanness of a woman in her impurity. Therefore, I poured out my wrath on them for the blood that they shed on the land, because they had defiled it with their idols. Also, I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed throughout the lands. According to their ways and their deeds, I judged them. They were defiled by their sin. That's easy to see in this passage of Scripture. And their sin defiled the land. Have you been defiled? But worse than that, they not only defiled the land, they defiled the name of God. Ezekiel 36, verse 20. When they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name because it was said of them, These are the people of the Lord, yet they have come out of the land. I want to ask you some questions tonight as you think about this with me. Have you disgraced the name of the Lord your God? Did you know that the only way a watching world can catch a glimpse of God's glory, Jesus said, is if you let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven? Uh, does this community glorify God because of what they see in your life? The surrounding nations saw that the blessing of God no longer rested on the life of his people. And so they interpreted that, that lack of blessing not so much as a sign of weakness in God's people, but as a sign of weakness in God. What about the world of today? How do they interpret what appears to be the absence of God's presence and power in the church? Just in, as in those days, the world doesn't understand that God can remove his presence from his people when they are defiled. They see weakness in the church, and they interpret that weakness in the church as weakness in God. But it is our defilement that has brought this weakness. It is our sin that has caused God to withdraw his presence, and as a result, his name is disgraced among the people where we live. But then in chapter 36, verses 21 and 22, we read, the Lord says, but I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations where they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord, it is not 
for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. You'll notice God is about to do something. There is a work that he is about to do. And you'll see that God is concerned about his own reputation. God is, was concerned about his reputation then. God is concerned about his reputation now. God has invested his reputation in you. Have you taken the Lord's name in vain? What I mean by that is not out of your mouth, but have you been less than God saved you to be? Have there been people who have seen you do things and heard things from you that have defamed God's name? In the rest of this passage, God outlines the work that he wants to do among his people and why. There are many things. I'm going to show, you, show them to you one verse at a time. Here is number one. The work that God wants to do is for his glory. From Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 23, he said, And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. When we sin, we don't want anybody to know it because we're afraid of what it might do to our reputation. You are concerned for your reputation when you sin. God is concerned for his. If God's reputation has been sullied because of my sin, I need not be praying for God to restore my reputation. I need to be praying that God would vindicate the holiness of his name. Number two, the work that God wants to do among his people will prove that he is holy. Look at the second part of verse 23. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among them, among you in their sight. Have you pondered what that would mean? For God to prove himself holy among us before the eyes of a watching world? What would it mean if, if God proved himself holy in the midst of First Baptist Church so that all of Loosedale would know it? It is a work that God wants to do among his people that will get the attention of the nations. Number three. The work that God wants to do rests on his own shoulders. Verse 24, For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. And we'll expand on that thought in just a moment. But realize it's something only God can do. The work that God wants to do in your life is something only God can do. The work he wants to do in me is something only he can do. These people could not accomplish that. Only God could do it. It was a work that rested on his shoulders. Next, the work that God wants to do will be a work of cleansing. Verse 25 of chapter 36. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and all your idols. Now, I call to your attention that the work that God wants to do rests on his own shoulders. This work that God intends to do among his people is first a cleansing work. His people have been defiled, and God will act to remove that defilement. He says they will be clean and cleansed of all filthiness and idols. What would that look like in your life? What would that look like in our church? What if those of us here tonight experienced a work of God in our lives that left us clean and cleansed of all our filthiness? What if suddenly all of our priorities were radically reoriented? And what if God did it in such a way that the surrounding community began to see it and talk about God's activity in the life of his people? Next. The work that God wants to do will change the hearts 
and the desires of his people. That's right. It's going to change the hearts and the desires of his people. Verse 26. This, to me, is one of the most exciting verses in the Bible. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. This is a work of God. This is something only God can do. It is his sovereign work. By that I mean it is a work he initiates, and it is a work he brings to completion. It is God calling the alcoholic to sobriety and giving him the heart and the strength to be sober. It is God calling one person who has a grudge against another to forgive that person and giving them the heart and the strength to do so. It is God calling a church to repentance and revival and then giving them the heart and the strength to surrender to his will. Now, I realize that in every church, there are people who have absolutely no desire for a fresh work of God in their life. But the remarkable thing about this passage of Scripture is that under these circumstances, God kindles that work in a person's life in spite of their reluctance and then gives them the heart and the strength to pursue it. It is a work that only God can do. Next, the work that God wants to accomplish among his people is going to be accomplished by his spirit. Verse 27, he says, and I will put my spirit within you and I will and I will cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. After all, this is a work for, for God's glory alone. Therefore, it is his battle. We've already said it rests completely on his shoulders. Do you realize, do you realize that Pentecost was not planned? At least not by the church. It was a sovereign work of God for his purpose and for his glory. True revival among the people of God is not something we plan. It is the plan of God for us. It, it occurs as a result of God's activity among us and within us. It is about God's desire to vindicate the holiness of his name, to prove himself holy among us before the eyes of a watching world so that the nations will know that he is God. Next, the work that God wants to do will secure your destiny, verse 28, and you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers so that you will be my people and I will be your God. Do you know that it is impossible for the people of God to secure their own destiny? It was impossible for them to rescue themselves from their defilement. It would be impossible for them in their own strength to keep themselves clean. It would, it would not be possible for them by might or by power to secure their own land. It would be a work of God alone that would secure their destiny. That too was something only God could do. So it is for us today. Jude wrote, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. What a wondrous work it is that God wants to do in your life and mine. And remember, it is something that only God can do. The work that God wants to do next is a complete work. He says in verse 29, moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanness. Imagine that. From all, not part. Complete, not partial. Fully, not halfwayly. It is God's work after all. By the way, does God do shoddy work? No. The work that God wants to do in your life, in my life, in your church, in my church, is a complete work. Next. The work that God wants to do will turn your heart away from past sin. Verse 31, 
Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. Seldom are we deeply bothered by sin while we are living in it. There might be an occasional twinge of conscience, but we are more comfortable and happy, at least in our own minds, living with our sin than without it. But as a result of God's work in us, we come to look with loathing on who we were and how we lived before God's activity in our lives. We come to see our sin the way God sees it, as something detestable and disgusting and destructive. God hates sin, and once His work has been done in our hearts, so do we. Next, finally, the work that God wants to do will bring you to complete repentance. Verse 32, I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Lord God. Think about that. Not for your sake. Be it known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. God makes it clear that this is his sovereign work. It is an act of grace. That same mercy that brought discipline without our request or our permission will bring repentance and revival. God will prove himself holy among us before the eyes of a watching world. And if you'll notice, the end result of God's activity, the end result of God's activity, that is the end result of God's activity in my life, the end result of God's activity in your life, and the end result of God's activity in the life of his church is missionary at heart. Ezekiel 36, verse 23. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy among you before their eyes. Clearly, this has been God's purpose from the outset. God wants a watching world to recognize his activity. Verse 36. Then the nations around you will know that I have rebuilt what was destroyed and that I have replanted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. But it is also God's people who will know that he is God. So he says finally in verse 38, so will the ruined cities be filled with flocks of people, and they will know that I am the Lord. May God do such a work in our church. May he do such a work in your life and in mine. Thank you so much for listening.